Welcome to TYT Interviews. I'm Dave Kohler. I am the producer and the co-founder of the Young Turks. I'm here with Anthony Sadie today, and we're going to talk about uh, a couple of different topics that are near and dear to my heart. Anthony Sadie is a chess master. That just explains the board that's here in front of us. He also traveled to the USSR many times in his chess career. And he's here now because he wrote a book called 1983, The Russian Revolution that, well, it's called 1983, A Dialectical Novel, and the subtitle is The Russian Revolution That Might Have Been. So we're going to talk about the book, we're going to talk about the USSR. The timing of this interview is very unique because of what's going on in Ukraine. We'll ch touch on that, and of course, we'll touch on chess. Now, why am I conducting this interview? First of all, Anthony Sadie, welcome to the TYT interview. Thank you. So why am I conducting this interview and not Jenk? Because I'm the number one chess player at the Young Turks. So I had to jump into this opportunity. So thank you for indulging us. And while we're uh, talking, we're going to try not to interrupt. And it might not work, but we're going to play a game of chess. And here's my first move, e4. And the master counters with d5, uh, e5. And uh, let us begin. So 1983. A dialectical novel. Uh, this is the fruit of several trips that you made to the USSR during uh, what time period did you travel? To? From 1960 to 1973. Okay. Tell, tell me about your trips to the USSR. Did you really uh, explore away from the chess community? Did you get out to the cities and villages and the provinces? Or? I got out. I traveled around. The primary reason was to play chess mm -hmm. and Russia was the mecca of chess in right. those days. So that was a big professional concern. And, and I certainly enjoyed playing chess with such great players. But I was fascinated by the culture, the history, the people. And I got to talk to as many as possible. Did you travel freely on your own, or was it guided? How did it work in the Soviet Union? Well, I was there on a visa for a visiting sportsman, and, mm -hmm. and when I said I want to travel around here and there, they kind of frowned a little bit, but I, I got to do it more or less freely. Okay. And out of those trips and your conversations with the people was born an idea for this novel. If, uh, 1983 is basically a, it's a, a, a totalitarian state novel. It talks about an alternative way that the, the USSR could have unraveled. There are two storylines in this, if I'm not mistaken. One is about the workers and their condition. And there's another storyline about dissident intellectuals who are discussing amongst themselves how the revolution, how the socialist experiment went and how it went wrong. Is that a fair exactly. characterization? Exactly. And, and so tell me how you ca came to this uh, novel. Well, I got home from my last trip to the Soviet Union, went home to my Santa Monica apartment. I got over jet lag. Mm -hmm. And the whole story of this novel came to me in 48 hours. Hmm. And this is when? In your, la after your last trip? 1973. OK. Uh, from then, from that point, I merely had to sit down and write it, which took about a year. So let me just do knight to f3 while we're here. Now, are the characters in this book, do they represent people that you met specifically? Are you synthesizing everything you heard from people in the USSR? I synthesized everything I read, every, everyone I met. Uh, all the different strains of dissidents that were going on in the Soviet Union. There was the national strain from the, the Baltics, who never wanted to be part of the Soviet right. Union. Uh, there's the Ukrainian strain, because Ukrainian nationalism is not something new that just developed in the last week. Right. Okay. More like centuries of it. Yeah. There was such an important demonstration in Moscow in 1968 when Czechoslovakia was invaded. Russian intellectuals went into Red Square, which was unheard of really mm -hmm. at that time, and raised banners that said, for their freedom and ours. And I'm expecting something similar in the next few days. In, in, in Moscow. Moscow. Well, we're going to get into Ukraine because we can't avoid it this week. But let's stick for a minute to the book. So 
the course of the alternate course of history that occurs in this book that li that it, the implies that the Soviet Union will be dis dissolved in a different manner than it was. Is this was this your vision? How you would have liked it to occur, or uh, how well, I, yes, I would have liked it to occur. Mm -hmm. uh, it at the time that I wrote it, it was a pretty radical idea, and it was too hot to handle for the mainstream publishers that rejected it. Just one publisher in Canada said, we love this. We just would love to do this book, but we don't do fiction, okay? Uh -huh. So I was discouraged. I put it on the shelf. And then a year ago, through a contact in the East, uh, I, I made a connection with Seagull Press in Baltimore, which is a Russian emigre press. They've published Yevtushenko and a few other books, Emil Dreitzer, my friend, uh, who's <clears throat> one of the most prolific American writers born in the Soviet Union. And they said, yeah, we can do this. Okay. Well, that's a testament to persistence. One of my questions was going to be, so you wrote this in 1973, why are we talking about it now? And that's the reason. By the way, you can get this book uh, from the website, 1983thenovel.com, Siegel Press website, or of course, it's, you can access it through it. Amazon. Now, when I was in 10th grade, one of the wisest and most prescient predictions ever came to my ears. Uh, the, I was taking a class in general issues and history and politics, and the teacher brought in a, a young Russian kid. I don't remember if he was a dissident or was living in Russia or, or had moved out. But he said to us very simply, look, there's this system here in the Soviet Union with a bunch of old conservative leaders, and they're clogging it up. You got you know, Brezhnev at the time. After he passes, there's going to be another a series of these guys. As soon as they're all done with their shot at power, a young guy is going to come on, and the whole thing's going to change. And sure enough, after Brezhnev, you got Andropov, Andropov and Krushenko, I believe his name was. Chernenko. Chernenko, right. They're interchangeable. Then they died, Gorbachev came in, and in what seemed like in an instant, historically speaking, the whole thing fell apart. This guy nailed it brilliantly. What was wrong with that dissolution of the USSR? Well, what, what was wrong with it was that promises were made to the people that were broken. They were promised to become the owners of their factories, mm -hmm. in, 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 in essence. But some clever guys got, her, got around that obstacle and became oligarchs and billionaires. Yeah. It wasn't supposed to happen that way. Right. Do you think Putin, where does he stand with respect to the oligarchs? Or, or is he trying to set up an independent power base that has nothing to do with that? Or does he, do they work well, for him? Does he work for them? There are Putin's oligarchs, and there well, are anti-Putin anti oligarchs. Oligarchs. Okay, so. But basically, he's running a kleptocracy. Yeah. I grew up in the tail end of the Cold War, and I heard all the propaganda here in the US in the 80s. And I always wondered what life was like. And one thing I liked about this book is there's a, it's a fairly rich description, of, at least of the workers, the working life in the Soviet Union. Now tell me a little bit about that. People, the ordinary person, the mythical ordinary person, what was life like at the well, height of the in, Soviet Union? If you read the New York Times, you didn't read much about working class people, and reporters don't tend to talk to the ordinary people. They talk to uh, professors and uh, officials. That's actually true in, in domestic reporting in this country. but. Uh, I made the point of staying with families and being in a, a railroad car and having long conversations in my broken Russian. And it's, it's quite amazing to, to know how the people really think. Yeah. And you took that and you put it in this novel, and I guess that's why there's a, there's a tinge of authenticity in this, for sure. I, I really felt like I was getting what I wanted to read back in the 80s. I wish they had published it when you first tried. Well, I got praise from the most important American authority on the Soviet Union, Harrison Salisbury, who lived there for many years and won the Pulitzer Prize reporting for the New York Times. He said it had the ring of truth. Right. And that was 
very gratifying to me, but not to the publishers that I, I sent the book to originally. Well, let's get into that. You mentioned the publishers thought it was too hot to handle. What did they, or what do you mean by that? What, this is not anti-American or anything like that. So what, what's well, too hot? Well, it's not really pro-American either. It's not a, it has nothing to do with America. I, That's I true. Uh, so what was too hot well, about Well, let's it? kind of go back to George H.W. Bush. Okay. Uh, who, when the Soviet Union was in the process of falling apart, went to Kiev in Ukraine and gave a speech which essentially said, gee, all this disorder that's going on, we don't like that. Right. I mean, uh, we, we have good relations with, with Moscow, and uh, uh, what's all this trouble? Okay, and, the right-wing columnist William Sapphire wrote a column calling it the Chicken Kiev Speech. Uh -huh. Okay, so basically the establishments everywhere like the status quo and revolution is frightening to, to every establishment in this world. Right. I mean the Saudis practically had a nervous breakdown when the Arab Spring broke out. Mm -hmm. Just one example. Well, I always, after a few years of living as a teenager through the Cold War, I came to the conclusion that the whole thing was bullshit and it was just a military industrial complex creation that we didn't have to be blood-borne enemies against the Soviet Union. Uh, I agree with you. So what kind of American policy would you have preferred starting in 1946 or 1945? Uh, well, I was just a little kid, right? right. But there was a candidate for president in 1948. Wallace. Henry Wallace, former vice president of the United States. If he had won, there would have been no Cold War. But that's a whole other right, story. Right, that is a whole other story, a whole other interview. Uh, just so we're talking to Anthony Sadie here. This book is 1983, a dialectical novel. It's about the Soviet Union. And you can get it at uh, the website, 1983thenovel.com. So, okay, so we've talked about Ukraine, uh, it's the elephant in the room. W what are your thoughts on what's going on? How, how, does you, how do your past experiences in the Soviet Union uh, inform your, your current opinions? Uh, and you alluded to some at the beginning of the interview. Well, I think the critics who say American foreign policy since 1990 has screwed up are correct. Yeah. In other words, putting all these NATO countries all around Russia, it's not what you do. I mean, they say Russia is a paranoid nation. So how do you treat a paranoid person? Do you surround the person? <laughs> okay, yeah. that's not what you do. Right. Um, I understand that uh, U.S. foreign policy has been flawed forever, but, but the issue is that the, that the Russia signed in 1994 the Budapest Agreement wherein Ukraine gave up a thousand nuclear weapons and had its integrity guaranteed by Russia, the United States, by Britain. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't include sending troops in when you don't don't like right. what's going on. Well, I'm sure Putin is not interested in some treaty signed by some predecessors of his. But I, I like what you're saying because it echoes what I've always thought. My whole life, anyone who, who was born during the Cold War, the whole, our whole, all the time, the only excuse we ever heard for why we can't do anything is because we can't do it because the Soviet Union, we've got to fight them, that's our number one priority, we have to contain the Soviet Union. That's why we could never solve the Arab-Israeli conflict, that's why there was apartheid in South Africa, that's why we had to make deals with right-wing dictators or support right-wing dictators in Latin America. Everything was through the lens of the Cold War. Then that stopped in 90, 92, depending on when you call it. That should have the world should have burst into an openness of liberalism and freedom and cooperation, and it didn't, because as you said, leaders messed up right from the beginning. And we're all, we're back into, they found terrorism to replace the Soviet Union, and we're back into the mess and worse than we've ever been. The US and Russia, if they were such two big polar powers, they shouldn't, after the Soviet Union collapsed, we should cooperate and solve the problems of the world. But we didn't. We, took a, a semi-antagonistic stance toward him, as you're describing. Bad habits just keep 
keep on, you know. We are way behind here, and I, don't, and I think I'm going to survive this chess game. You're probably not going to have enough time to defeat me. I'm prepared for you. <laughs> Let's talk about chess for a moment. From the 40s, 50s, 60s, Russians dominated the top ranks of world chess. Did you meet and get close to any of the great champions, the Petrosians, Tals, Spassky's of the world? Indeed, I did. did and I call Tal and Spassky my friends. Okay. Petrosian was another kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> I once asked him to to take a certain monograph back to the Soviet Union to its author. It was called The Psychoanalysis of Chess. And he says, this is not dialectical materialism. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. He was well brought up. Did, uh, so, which your friends you considered Tal and Spassky or Spassky your friends? Did they, what were they, what was their attitude toward the Soviet Union? Well, and the country they were living in. Tal, by definition, had to be a subversive because he was the most humorous man I've ever met. Mm -hmm. He had a joke every other minute, and he could keep you in stitches. You don't Somebody like that, that is not a conformist. Right. You don't think of that kind of character as a chess champion. But. Well, he was a genius uh, in, in many ways. Right. Uh, Spassky was a dissident from the word go. Really? Yeah. Yet, when that's how valuable chess was to the Soviet leadership, because these guys might have been either dissidents or at least not on the rails, but if they're the top, they, they had to represent Russia. Because chess is a meritocracy, and, yeah. and preeminence in chess was very important to the Kremlin. Chess was cultivated, and great players were coddled, there was this meeting that they held before Spassky went to play Fischer mm -hmm. in Iceland in 1972. Uh, the top brass of the uh, sports ministry was there, and uh, one of them said, well, Boris, we, we decided that when you go to Iceland to play Fischer, we want a, a doctor to be with you. And Spassky says, what kind, a sexologist? <laughs> That's how irreverent he was. Right, okay. Uh, so you mentioned Fisher. I'm curious, and I'm sure any chess fan is, that, about what happened to him after the World Championship. Did you have contact with Bobby Fisher after the cha World Championship, all through these? Yes, I did. Things? And do you have uh, insight into why he became uh, such a recluse and a d difficult person? What, was he sick? I'm going to refer you to the definitive book on Bobby's mind. It's, mm -hmm. it's by Dr. Joseph Pontiroto, and he, uh, he deals with all that. I'm not, okay. a, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'll, I'll abstain. That may, that's fair enough. When, when was the last communication you had with Bobby Fischer? Though, 1979. So we're talking with uh, Anthony Sadie, an international chess master who wrote this book, which you can get from 1983thenovel.com. A really nicely descriptive story of what could have happened inside the Soviet Union. But you don't just read it for your interest in what could have happened. You read it because it describes what life was like in a very down-to-earth, down down on-the-street fashion, so... Uh, well, the, the big issue in the leftist circles in those times was, can the leftist intellectuals really get together with the working class and cooperate? Because mm -hmm. if they did, a lot of rulers would be uh, nervous, okay? And in the book, you'll see that eventually they come together. Yeah. So the Cold War did end and the Soviet Union did dissolve. Uh, not through war with China and through an uprising by its own people. What, what were you feeling in those years, 1989 through 1982? Was that exciting? You didn't know that it was going to go sour. You well, know, it, it there, were, there were two groups of Americans that were excited in those years. One was the corporate capitalist class that was licking its chops. Markets to see how we can get into Russia now and we can do a lot of profitable business. And there was another group of us who were on the left thinking, can we now get some kind of socialism 
that is humane, mm -hmm. that is something perhaps like happened in Czechoslovakia in 1968, where we don't have the secret police, there were hopes. Right. You, uh, the other definitive book on that subject, of course, is The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of secret police, uh, I meant to ask you earlier, so uh, did you feel at all in danger when you were going, traveling around the Soviet Union talking to people about sensitive subjects in those 1960s and 70s? Well, there were times when if I raised a, ter a certain subject, uh, I would get a, uh, in effect, a no comment. Right. They'd protect themselves. Uh, of course, the, the classic story is, uh, uh, I, I, uh, here's, here's the fictional story. I asked a Russian, uh, do you have freedom of speech? And he says, what's that? And I said, well, any time I want, I can go into the square and I can say, President Nixon is a dirty dog. Mm -hmm. He says, oh yes, we have that. We can do that anytime we want. Right. Yes, I heard the joke. Let me just take this pawn and see what happens to me. We are not going to finish, but I survived the chess game against a, a, a master who came in fourth at the U.S. Championships when? In 1960, I believe it was. That was 74. Uh, 74. 74? Okay. Well, you have been playing very well in Thank the game. You. Well, that is, right there is a, all, all the praise that I need. But I have the ingredient I need to beat you, to beat you which is called Zitzfleisch <laughs> in German. <laughs> well, I would call it experience. I would also call it total distraction. It's my first interview for the Young Turks. I'm trying to talk to you about interesting subjects, and yet I, I want to continue playing this game. So I, I don't You're know. You're multitasking. What I'm to do. I am multitasking. It's I'd like to point out that several years before my book was written, there was a book by Andrei Amalrik, a Russian, mm -hmm. called Will the Soviet Union Survive Until 1984? And he was an international celeb uh, because of his radical views and he got punished for it. He got a a free trip to Siberia out of his out of his trouble. And I was just a guy in Santa Monica, all right? right. But I also have a vision and I, I prefer my vision. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> uh, jumping around again, I, I didn't quite understand what you think is you think might happen in the next few days in Moscow as a reaction to the Ukraine crisis. I can well, you just talk about that again a little more? What, I, what I'm told is that uh, simultaneous with moving into Ukraine, Putin's government arrested the most famous Dissident. opposition politician in Moscow, right. Navalny. House arrest, I believe. Yeah. And I heard that uh, the young women from Pussy Riot were rearrested. I think mm -hmm. they were released. But I think that uh, this kind of, you know, war, war is the opposite of revolution, and revolution annuls war. Mm -hmm. So he, Putin wants to keep all his bases covered. But now people in Russia can make, try to make money, and that is going to be of much more interest to them than going to the Red Square and holding a placard. I, I, wouldn't it be? That's the, the just big in trap. general? Just in general, in any country. I yeah, well, you know, there's a certain limit to telling the millions of people in the masses who are barely making ends meet, no problem, you might hit a, an idea and become a great entrepreneur. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Okay? The, we hear that all the time right. in this then country. You'll, you'll be okay, never mind everything else, right? That's there's a limitation, you know, how long you can. Uh, as the public, you can buy that. Maybe Putin, who's a smart guy, is sensitive to that, and he's not going to press this Ukraine thing anymore. Well, uh, let's hope that, uh, number one, no blood is shed. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand none has been shed so far, and I think extreme discipline on the part of the Ukrainian nation is required. Any hothead can start a shooting war. Stopping it is more difficult. Yeah. So let's just stay like this for a while. All right. So, well, with what's going on in Ukraine now, everyone talks about the Cold War. First of all, I think this crisis echoes its 
blowback on what the atrocities committed by both Germany and Russia in Ukraine during World War II. And of course, it goes centuries back. The whole Poland-Ukraine area is a battlefield between East and West. But we are reminded that the Cold War did exist. It consumed everybody's lives for many decades. And it's a good time to re consider reading Anthony Sadie's novel, 1983. So check it out. I want to thank you for coming and for playing and for talking to me in this interview. My pleasure. Uh, maybe we'll get a couple moves in when we don't have to be talking at the same time. But uh, thank you for, uh, for coming.